Now let's review calculations. Calculations are very important when studying for the NAPLEX exam. It's very important that you review calculations on a daily basis since calculations are the one part of the exam in which you will be able to anticipate what they will ask you. It is very important to review calculations daily so that when you come to take the exam, you can answer calculation questions quickly, which give you more time to answer the other questions. It is very important for you to know which unit of measurement you are answering each question in. You may get the right answer on the exam, but if you forget to convert your units at the end to the correct unit of measure, then you will still get the question wrong. Therefore, it is very important for you to know these conversions off the top of your head. We will start off with liquid measurements. One teaspoon is equal to 5 milliLS. One tablespoon is equal to 15 milliLS. I fluid ounce is equal to around 29.57 milliLS, which is rounded up to 30 milliLS. One cup is equal to 8 ounces. One pint is equal to 16 ounces or 473 milliLS. One quart is equal to two pints or 946 milliLS. One gallon is equal to four quarts or 3,785 millils. For weight, one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds. One ounce is equal to 28.5 grams. One pound is equal to 454 grams. Eye grain is equal to 65 milligrams. For height, one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters, and one meter is equal to 100 centimeters. For millikivalents and millimoles, monovalent ions like potassium and sodium one milliequivalent equals one millimole, while for divalent ions, one milliequivalent equals 0.5 millimoles. It is very important to know your rounding rules. For multi-step calculations, never round until the last step of the calculation. If the number is four or below, then you would round down. An example of this is if you, if you answer is 347.48 N and the question asks to round to the nearest whole answer, then you would round to 347. If your answer ends in five or above, then you would round up. When setting up proportions, you want to match both numerators and both denominators. Every item in the left numerator must match to every item in the right numerator. Every item in the left denominator must match to every item in the right denominator. You want to match numerator and denominator of each fraction. Items in the left fraction must match, and items in the right fraction must match. If you are still unsure on how to set up fractions, we will be reviewing them in later math videos, so stay tuned. Next, let's review drug dose conversions. For converting aminophylline to theophylline, you want to multiply by 0.8. And when converting theophylline to aminophy, just IN, you want to divide by 0.8. An easy way to remember this is to remember ATM, which stands for aminophylline to theophylline multiply. For calcium salts, 1 gram calcium carbonate equals 400 mg elemental calcium, and 1 gram calcium citrate equals 210 mg elemental calcium. For insulin, generally most insulins are 1 to 1 ratio, but there are a couple of exceptions. When switching from twice-daily NPH insulin to Glargine insulin, you want to use only for 180 of the previous NPH dose. When going from 2-Jo to an insulin Glargine or Detamir, then you would use 80% of the 2-Jo dose. For lithium salts, 5 milliO of lithium citrate syrup is equivalent to 8 milliequivalent of lithium. 8 milliequivalent of lithium ions is equivalent to to 300 milligrams of lithium carbonate tablets. For loop diuretics, 40 milligrams of furosemide is equal to 20 milligrams of torsemide, which is equal to 1 milligram of bumetanide. For potassium chloride, 10% of potassium chloride is equal to 20 milliequivalents over 15 millimillions. When converting from IV to PO for medications, here are the conversion ratios. For furosemide, it is 1 to 2. For levothyroxin, it is 0.75 to 1. For metoprolol, it is 1 to 2.5. Moving on to statins. To remember the statins conversion, you'll want to remember pharmacist rock at saving lives and preventing fatty deposits. 
That'll help you navigate between converting statin dosages. An example of this is if the exam asks you, a patient is currently taking atorvastatin, 10 mg gallus, but the provider wants to switch the patient to simvastatin. What would be the dose? The correct answer would be 20 mg, since that's the equivalent dose to atorvastatin, 10 mg. It's important for you to know the difference between iron and elemental iron. What is elemental iron? Elemental iron refers to the actual amount of usable iron available in a supplement. Different forms of iron salts contain varying percentages of elemental iron. Dosing. Correct dosing depends on elemental iron, not the total weight of the salt. Counseling. Patients need to know the proper formulation to meet their daily iron requirements. A potential question you may run into is, a patient has been prescribed 130 mg of elemental iron daily. How many 325 mg tablets of ferrous sulfate should the patient take to meet this requirement? The solution is, ferrous sulfate contains 20% elemental iron, 325 mg times 0.20 equals 65 mg elemental iron per tablet. To achieve 130 mg of elemental iron, you would divide 130 mg by 65 mg, which would give you two tablets daily. When reviewing iron intake, make sure to keep in mind to always identify the form of iron salt prescribed. Be comfortable calculating elemental iron from different formulations. Recognize the importance of counseling patients on potential side effects like constipation and strategies for managing them. What are opioid conversions? Opioid conversions involve calculating equivalent doses when switching between different opioids or dosage forms. This ensures patients receive a therapeutic yet safe dose. Steps for opioid conversions Start with determining the total daily dose of the current opioid. Convert to morphine milligram equivalents using an equianalgesic conversion table. Adjust for incomplete cross tolerance, typically reducing the dose by 25-50% for safety. Divide the new total dose into the appropriate dosing schedule. Check out our other videos to find examples of these types of questions and examples of them. Steroid conversions are crucial for managing conditions like inflammatory diseases, asthma, or adrenal insufficiency. Pharmacists need to know how to convert between corticosteroids to ensure equivalent dosing and safe transitions. Steroid conversions involve calculating equivalent doses when switching between corticosteroids, considering their potency and duration of action. Steps for steroid conversions. Identify the total daily dose, TDD, of the current corticosteroid. Use an equivalent dosing table to determine the equivalent dose of the new corticosteroid. Adjust the dose if needed based on clinical factors, like tapering for long-term use. A question you may see on your exam may look like, a patient is currently taking prednisone 40 mg daily for an autoimmune condition. The physician decides to switch to dexamethasone due to its longer duration of action. What is the equivalent daily dose of dexamethasone? In which the equivalent daily dose of dexamethasone would be 6 millilarsone. It's important to memorize so you'll be able to convert between steroids. Moving on to ratio relationships. The ratio of 4 to 8 is equal TI4 divided by 8 which could also be seen as 1 divided by 2 or 1 parts to 2 parts. Moving on to common IV fluids. IV fluids are solutions used to hydrate patients, provide nutrients, or correct imbalances in the body. Here's an easy way to understand some of the most common IV fluids. Normal saline, NS. What is it? A solution of 0.9% sodium chloride in water. Why use it? It matches the salt concentration of your blood, making it isotonic. It's great for general hydration, blood loss, or when you need to boost blood pressure. Think of it like salty water that's balanced with your body. For 1.2 NS, half normal saline. What is it? A weaker version of NS 
with 0.45% NaCl in water. Why use it? It's hypotonic, less salty than your blood, so it helps hydrate cells. Used for mild dehydration or to mix with other medications. For 1 Prosh 4 NS, quarter normal saline. What is it? An even weaker version with 0.225% NaCl in water. Why use it? Rarely used alone, but good for specific situations like pediatrics or very mild dehydration. D5W, which stands for dextrose, 5% in water. What is it? A solution of 5% dextrose, aka sugar in water. Why use it? Provides energy, calories, and hydration. It starts as isotonic, but acts hypotonic in the body because your cells absorb the sugar. Think of it like sugar water for quick energy and hydration. For D20Ws, which stands for dextrose, 20% in water. What is it? A more concentrated sugar solution with 20% dextrose in water. Why use it? Provides more calories in small volumes. Used in special cases like severe hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. Think of it like super sweet water for emergencies. Moving on to dissociation particles versus valence. Understanding dissociation particles and valence is crucial for solving problems related to osmolality, tonicity, and calculating ionic strength in pharmacy and biochemistry. Let's break it down simply. Dissociation particles. What are they? Dissociation particles are the number of pieces, particles, a compound breaks into when dissolved in water. Why is it important? These particles affect the solution's osmolality, which influences water movement in the body. Valence. What is it? Valence refers to the charge of an ion, which helps determine its chemical reactivity and role in the body. Why is it important? Valence is used for calculating electrolyte equivalents, which are essential for managing conditions like electrolyte imbalances. All right, let's dive into a topic you'll definitely need to know for the NAPLEX. Calories provided by macronutrients. This concept is foundational when calculating nutritional needs for patients, especially in cases like parenteral or enteral nutrition. Let's start with the basics. The three macronutrients we're talking about are carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Each of these provides energy, but they do so at different levels. Here's the golden rule to memorize. Carbohydrates provide 4 calories per gram. Proteins also provide 4 calories per gram. Fats are the most calorie-dense, providing 9 calories per gram. And don't forget about alcohol, which isn't a macronutrient but is often tested. It provides 7 calories per gram. Why is this important? Because patients in the hospital setting often receive their nutrition via IV, parenteral nutrition, or PN, or feeding tubes, enteral nutrition, or EN. As a healthcare provider, you're expected to calculate the total calories from these sources to ensure patients meet their energy requirements. Moving on to height in inches. Here is an example of a patient who is 5 feet 6 inches. How many inches is the patient? The correct answer is 66 inches. All right, let's dive into one of the trickier topics on the NAPLEX. Interpreting arterial blood gases, or ABGs. These tests give you a snapshot of a patient's acid-base balance and oxygenation. It's a critical skill, especially for managing patients in ICU settings or those with respiratory or metabolic disorders. Now, an ABG report has three main components. pH, which measures blood acidity or alkalinity, PaCO2, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and the respiratory component, and HCO3, bicarbonate, which represents the metabolic component. A normal pH is between 7.35 and 7.45. If it falls below 7.35, we're looking at acidosis, and if it's above 7.45, we're dealing with alkalosis. Simple enough so far, right? Let's move to the other values. Next is PaCO2, which has a normal range of 35 to 45 minitamiaturs. If PaCO2 is below 35, there's less CO2 in the blood, which points to alkalosis. 
Conversely, if it's above 45, CO2 is accumulating, causing acidosis. This is your respiratory component, always linked to how the lungs are functioning. Then we have HCO3 with a normal range of 22 to 26 mQL. If HCO3 drops below 22, it signals a metabolic acidosis. On the other hand, if it rises above 26, that's metabolic alkalosis. So, CO2 tells you about the respiratory system and HCO3 tells you about the metabolic system. Now, when you're interpreting ABGs, the first step is to check the pH. Is it acidic, normal, or alkalotic? If it's not normal, decide whether the disturbance is acidosis or alkalosis. The second step is to look at the PACO2. If it's abnormal, the issue is likely respiratory. If it's normal, move to the third step. Check the HCO3. An abnormal bicarbonate level points to a metabolic issue. Once you've identified the primary disturbance, you need to assess whether the body is compensating. Compensation happens when the body tries to restore normal pH by adjusting the other component. For example, in respiratory acidosis, the kidneys retain bicarbonate to buffer the acidity. The compensation can be uncompensated if the pH is still abnormal, partially compensated if the pH is moving closer to normal, or fully compensated if the pH is back in the normal range, though other values remain abnormal. Finally, don't forget to check oxygenation by evaluating PaO2. A normal range is 80 to 100 millimeters. If it's low, the patient may have hypoxemia, which you'll need to address alongside the acid-base disturbance. If you're a little lost right now, don't worry. You will see it written out on the next slide. Let's break this down into four simple steps to help you figure out ABG problems quickly and easily. Step 1. Is it an acidosis or an alkalosis? Start by looking at the pH. If the pH is less than 7.35, it's acidosis. Too much acid or not enough base. If the pH is greater than 7.45, it's alkalosis. Too much base or not enough acid. So first, decide if the blood is too acidic or too basic. Step 2. What other values are abnormal? Now check PACO2 and HCO3. PACO2, normal, 35-45 mmHg, is the respiratory component. If PACO2 is high, it's causing acidosis. If PACO2 is low, it's causing alkalosis. HCO3 is the metabolic component. If HCO3 is low, it's causing acidosis. If HCO3 is high, it's causing alkalosis. Figure out which values are outside the normal range. Step 3 which abnormal value matches the pH. Next, match the pH from step 1 with the abnormal value from step 2. If the pay CO2 is causing the same disturbance as the pH, both acidic or both basic, the problem is respiratory. If the HCO3 is causing the same disturbance as the pH, the problem is metabolic. For example, if the pH is acidic and pay CO2 is high, it's respiratory acidosis. If the pH is acidic and HCO3 is low, it's metabolic acidosis. Step 4. What if both PACO2 and HCO3 are abnormal? This happens when the body is trying to compensate for the primary issue. If the pH is still abnormal, it's partially compensated. The body is trying but hasn't fixed the pH yet. If the pH is back to normal, it's fully compensated. The body has successfully corrected the pH. To figure out the primary problem, match the pH with either PACO2 or HCO3. The one that matches the pH is the primary issue, and the other one is compensating. 